So we're all aware that there are a ton of different types of jutsu in Naruto. There's ninjutsu, taijutsu, genjutsu, senjutsu, yin yang releases, elemental releases, keke genkai, keke tota, keke mora. There is almost as many ways to classify jutsus as there is jutsus themselves, with most jutsus falling into three or four categories. A keke genkai is a keke genkai, but also an elemental release and also ninjutsu. There's senjutsu boosted versions of ninjutsu moves, and there's senjutsu boosted versions of taijutsu moves. But even though there seems to be an almost limitless amount of ways to categorize jutsus, there's one category of jutsu that really confuse a lot of people. See, things like ninjutsu and taijutsu and genjutsu are simple. But every ninjutsu, taijutsu, and genjutsu can also be a different classification of jutsu. That is to say that any jutsu can also be a hidden jutsu, which is a term we hear thrown around a lot, hidden jutsu. But what does it really mean? How do you qualify whether a jutsu is hidden or non-hidden? And what disqualifies a jutsu from not being a hidden jutsu? And how is a hidden jutsu different from a clan-based keke genkai? And more importantly than anything, out of all of the hidden jutsu, what are the top 10 strongest? Well, today we're going to be answering all of those questions and more. But first, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like you want to answer questions about anime, you're going to love my other channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto or Boruto, I talk about any other anime. And if you really like the idea of me answering anime questions, you're going to want to go ahead and follow my brand new anime podcast, Utaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. But before we get into all that, guys, today we got to talk about one of our favorite recurring sponsors to the page, HelloFresh. This summer, HelloFresh is your best friend for achieving the summer body you've always wanted, as HelloFresh is trying to take the work out of eating well, as HelloFresh includes delicious, calorie smart or protein focused meals as well as vegan options for both lunch and dinner. But lunch and dinner aren't everything that HelloFresh offers you. HelloFresh is now offering new snacks and meals to add to your weekly order, like their new s'mores bundles for kids. But maybe this summer is going to be a bit hectic and busy for you. Don't lose out on cooking yourself healthy and sustainable meals, as HelloFresh also offers quick and easy options, which are ready in 15 minutes or less, making sure that you get to spend more time on the beach and less time in the kitchen. Personally, HelloFresh has played a massive role in my life for years. In fact, HelloFresh Fresh is the reason that I acquired the summer body of my dreams, as HelloFresh helped me lose over 50 pounds. Not to mention on top of that, HelloFresh has made me a five-star chef. But you probably don't believe me. Let me come show you. So tonight we're cooking gingery coconut soup. And honestly, before I started HelloFresh, I never thought making meals like this by myself was a possibility. So making soups like these are some of my favorite meals to make with HelloFresh. They're always light, yet super filling. And the beauty of HelloFresh is you're always cooking two portions. So you can either cook for you and somebody you love or yourself for two days. Mmm. I am a good cook. So what are you guys waiting for? Go to HelloFresh.com and use code 16NCHAMMER23 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's right. All you have to do is go to HelloFresh.com and use code 16NCHAMMER23 for 16 free meals and free shipping. With HelloFresh, you can have more time, more money, and better health. Sounds like pretty good summer goals to me. So... Hidden jutsu. It's a term that's as old as Naruto itself. So long as we've known people like Shikamaru or Choji or Ino, we've known of the existence of hidden jutsus. But what makes a jutsu hidden or secret? And how does that differentiate it from a clan-based Keke Genkai? Well, fortunately, the answer is rather simple. A hidden jutsu is a jutsu that's hidden, but specifically hidden by the people who use it. See, a jutsu being hidden means that it's not necessarily accessible to the public. It's not being taught in Shinobi Academy, Japanese Jonin team leaders aren't teaching their Genin it. Hidden Jutsus are Jutsus that are passed down specifically through a certain area or a certain clan. Therefore, only if you hail from that clan or that region will you ever learn this Jutsu. Because of this, those who exist in those clans or those regions are incredibly secretive about their Jutsu, making sure that the knowledge of this Jutsu is never written down or recorded in any means whatsoever. That is to say that the only way that the future generations of this clan or region ever learn this in jutsu is orally. That is to say that somebody who is older than them will teach them how to do it verbally, as opposed to giving them a scroll or a book that tells them page by page how to pull off this jutsu, as a scroll or a book can be stolen and then brought to another area. And then just like that, your hidden jutsu is 
Well, just the jutsu. However, technically not all hidden jutsus can be stolen. In fact, plenty of hidden jutsus can't be stolen because in order to pull off these hidden jutsus, you need a special ability or need to come from a certain lineage to use them in the first place. Gentle Fist is a really good example of this. The Byakugan itself is technically a Keke Genkai and therefore not a hidden jutsu. The Gentle Fist that is learned in tandem with the use of the Byakugan is a hidden jutsu, which is why the Hua clan tries so hard to protect their Byakugan because once somebody else is able to access the Byakugan, they can learn their hidden jutsu. However, a better example of this are the Akamichis. You see, the Akamichi clan's hidden jutsu is partial expansion jutsu. But even if Kakashi watched Choji use partial expansion all day long, Kakashi could never copy it because Kakashi doesn't have the innate ability that the Akamichis are born with caloric conversion. See, partial expansion jutsu requires a ton of chakra, and therefore the Akamichis are born with an innate ability called caloric conversion that's able to turn the calories in their bodies into chakra. And in no place is this more visible than when an Akamichi clan member uses their butterfly mode. This is why after using butterfly mode, an Akamichi clan member will end up being skinny. Because in order to use the butterfly mode, the height of power in the Akamichi clan, the Akamichi clan member using the butterfly mode converts so many of their calories into chakra that it actually emits chakra from their back in the form of butterfly wings. However, unfortunately for most hidden jutsus, they can be copied. Though not just through typical observation. One can't just watch Shikamaru use Shadow Paralysis Jutsu and figure out how to use it. And that's mostly because it's a Yin Jutsu, which most people don't have access to. However, just because you can't copy the Shadow Paralysis technique by watching it doesn't mean it's a Keke Genkai. See, this is where a lot of common misconceptions come from. People assume because the Shadow Paralysis technique and Jutsus like it are only used by the people who, you know, use the Jutsus, that they're Keke Genkai specific to those clans or regions. And while there is absolutely situations like this, like Haku Whose clan's Keke Genkai ice release? In the circumstances of things like partial expansion or shadow paralysis, those are just jutsus, not Keke Genkai. In order for something to be a Keke Genkai, it has to be the combination of two separate elemental releases or a dojutsu. Now, as to why a dojutsu is a Keke Genkai, I could legitimately never tell you. I don't know what combination of jutsus they are, but you know, you get what you get. And what separates a clan based Keke Genkai and a hidden jutsu is that while you can't technically learn shadow paralysis just by watching it you can learn it there's nothing that says you have to be a nara clan member to learn shadow paralysis technique it's just that their clan are the only people with the knowledge and therefore the only people who can sit down and tell others how to use the technique because they don't anybody else learning the technique and therefore nullifying their advantage in battle they make sure that the technique doesn't leave the clan however it doesn't matter how hard you try to learn haku's ice release you'll never learn it if you don't have that keke genka unless of course you're Sasuke in Sasuke Retsudan, in which case you have yin yang release and therefore you can combine water and air release in order to create ice release to make a little ice dagger to stab a dinosaur. The only people with the ability to create Keke Genkai out of the blue are those with yin and yang. This is how Muegi is able to use wood release and why Naruto should be able to use wood release. So now that we understand what a hidden jutsu is and how it differs from a Keke Genkai, we can get into the list. That is, we can start talking about what are the top 10 strongest hidden jutsus in Naruto. I'd like to say, however, that before we get into this list, that I'm not going to be talking about hidden jutsus that are hidden behind the wall of a Keke Genkai. Things like Jugo's abilities, Haku's ice release abilities, Sharingan abilities, Byakugan abilities, all that. I'm going to do a separate video ranking and explaining clan-based Keke Genkai. Therefore, it just feels more appropriate to split them up. And while that does technically get rid of a couple of pretty big hitters, trust me, there's still plenty on this list. Except for you know, the first one, because we have to start somewhere. Because coming in at number 10, we have the face copying jutsu. Did you completely forget about this hidden jutsu? Yeah, uh, so did I. Mostly because it hails from a filler episode that aired over a decade ago, but it was still a pretty cool concept. See, this hidden jutsu was only used by members of the Kedoin clan, which is a small clan led by Agari Kaisen. See, this clan popped up in one of the more forgettable filler arcs of the later days of Naruto, the Buried Gold Retrieval Arc. And I know what you're saying, face copying technique that just sounds like transformation jutsu. And 
it kind of is, but kind of worse and also kind of better. See, obviously with the power of transformation jutsu, a ninja is able to take the appearance of anybody they want to. The only problem with this is that transformation technique can be flawed. You can mess up a mole, you can get the wrong eye color, you can get the height wrong because transformation technique is entirely built upon how much you know about the person you're transforming into. And on top of this, even if you do technically pull off a perfect transformation, there's other ways to foil transformation technique. If you're able to see chakra signatures through the use of a Sharingan or Byakugan, and you know the chakra signature of the person being copied, you can see that this transformation doesn't match up with what you know. However, that's rare. What's actually more common is the fact that those who transform into others don't have their scent. And therefore, those with particularly keen noses like Kakashi or Kiba or Ninken, ninja dogs, are able to, so long as they know the scent of the person person that's being impersonated identify that the person using the transformation technique is not the original and therefore even though the transformation technique is incredibly powerful when it comes to recon it can and most likely will be foiled however the face copying technique eliminates one of those huge weaknesses see the face copying technique not only lasts a couple of days but also adjusts the scent of the user to that of the original to such a degree that even ninken like akamaru can't distinguish who the original is on top of this the face copying technique also guarantees a perfect transformation, meaning that the face copying technique is technically a better version of the transformation technique. But I also said it's a worse version of the transformation technique, and I wasn't lying. See, in order to pull off the face copying technique, the person using the technique has to wear a mask, which is already more set up than you need for the regular transformation technique. However, on top of needing a mask, the user also has to stand close to the person that they're copying for a pretty significant amount of time, like a whole minute it which means the only way you're using face copying technique on somebody is if they're asleep unconscious or tied up which i guess if you're using transformation technique or face copying technique to infiltrate as somebody else you're gonna have to make sure that the person you're copying is incapacitated otherwise two of you walking around is gonna look a bit suspicious but genuinely not even that suspicious considering how widely shadow clones are used like at any point in konoha there's like 14 naruto's running around one of those could very easily be a transformation technique now the face copying technique does suffer from the same setbacks as the transformation technique in that it doesn't matter if you have their appearance you can't use the abilities of the person you're copying so while the jutsu might be really good for infiltration it's about all it's good for but enough about that non-canon jutsu let's get to another non-canon jutsu because coming up at number nine we have the curse mandala this hidden jutsu belongs to the fuma clan one of the original and bigger clans that orochimaru tricks into joining the hidden sound village see the fuma clan had existed in the land of rice fields for generations however when orochimaru popped up the land of sound in what used to be the land of rice fields the fuma clan were kind of wrestled into the land of sound the Fuma clan, while most of them use chakra threads or archery, have a hidden jutsu. A hidden jutsu called Curse Mandala. Now, this is an ancient ninja art that's rare even amongst members of the Fuma clan. And that might be either because it's kind of sadistic or because it's kind of weak. See, a Fuma clan member who knows the Curse Mandala is able to summon it by making a pyramid with their hands. By creating this pyramid with their hands, they're able to summon a pyramid-like shape around an enemy. This 3D chakra construct will then begin to shrink around whoever they caught in the pyramid until eventually that pyramid becomes so small they get crushed to death now the shape of the pyramid is directly reflected in how close together the hands of the person using this technique become therefore it's not like the pyramid just begins to constrict naturally which makes this a pretty good tool of interrogation like hey you want to get smushed well if these two hands come together that's going to be a reality however the fact that the size of the curse mandala is actually associated to where your hands are is its biggest weakness because let's say hypothetically one of your hands gets knocked away from the triangle that you're created the curse mandala just disappears not to mention if you lose even a little bit of focus the curse mandala begins to disappear and if you lose a little bit of focus or the person you're trying to squish is just adequately strong enough they can just push out and break it and you know what happens if they break out of your curse mandala well one they're no longer in your jutsu but two it generates a massive explosion that hurts everybody but the person who was in the pyramid meaning let's say hypothetically you're standing a couple feet away from somebody and trying to smush them in your curse mandala if they break it there's a high probability you just die and for some reason the explosion centered around the person breaking out of your jutsu does not affect the person who just broke out of your jutsu so there's like an innate amount of risk to using this technique tie that into the fact that it really only works in one-on-one -on -one situations and yeah it's just 
barely higher than face copying technique. But enough with the non-canon jutsus, let's get to something that actually matters in the Naruto storyline. Because coming up at number eight, we have another jutsu associated with weird hand signs, the Yamanaka's mind transfer jutsu. Now, technically the mind transfer jutsu isn't the only ability of the Yamanaka. They also have mind body disturbance technique, mind clone switch technique, and mind puppet switch curse seal technique. But we're gonna open up talking about the base technique, the mind transfer jutsu. In order to pull off this jutsu, a Yamanaka clan member has to convert their consciousness into energy, specifically spiritual energy. They then send this spiritual energy at their opponent. The spiritual energy heads at an opponent relatively slowly in, in a straight line. So if the Yamanaka clan member happens to miss, their consciousness in the form of spiritual energy will just be floating around them until eventually it finds its way back to their body. Which is why whenever Eno misses the mind transfer technique, she's just unconscious for a couple of minutes. Kind of like Brooke with the Revive Vive fruit. His soul had to find his body. Because this, unfortunately, this technique can only be used against people who are either unconscious or not moving or restrained. However, if this technique does make contact, then the Yamanaka clan member using it is able to control the body of whoever they've transferred into, most of the time. If the person that the Yamanaka clan member is taking over has a particularly strong will, they can force them out of their consciousness. But most of the time, this technique isn't released until the Yamanaka clan member has decided they don't need to be in the body anymore. This technique was created for reconnaissance and is therefore pretty much only viable in reconnaissance missions. See, the reason this technique was created is so Yamanaka clan members could transfer their consciousness into enemies. They then, while controlling these bodies, could enter different villages, access documents they couldn't do prior, and then just leave the body once they had the information they needed. On top of this, as they're in control of somebody's physical body, they're able to access all of their physical capabilities, which is why you'll often see Yamanaka clan members using this technique on animals, like birds, as being able to take over a bird not only grants them flight, but nobody's suspecting them. And on top of this, a Yamanaka clan member is actually able to still use their own techniques while possessing somebody else's body. Now, we usually see this in the capacity of the Yamanaka clan member using their sensory abilities while in somebody else's body, as Yamanaka clan members are probably the most talented sensors within Konoha. But still, having access to the physical capabilities of the person you're taking over and your own jutsu simultaneously is not to be scoffed at. However, the major drawback of this technique is that while a Yamanaka clan member is using it, their own body doesn't work, which is actually why the Inishika Cho trio was made in the first place. So the Akamichis could keep the enemy away, the Nahor could keep the enemy still, and the Yamanaka could grab their body while they are unable to move. Then, once the Yamanaka clan member is in somebody else's body, the Akamichi and the Nahor clan member will protect that Yamanaka. However, not all of the techniques of the Yamanaka clan require the Yamanaka clan member to lose consciousness, as the mind-body disturbance technique allows the Yamanaka clan member to remain conscious while also using their hidden abilities on an enemy. This technique allows the Yamanaka clan member to control somebody's body, but not their mind, meaning it's comparable to attaching chakra strings to somebody. While in control of an enemy's body, they can force that enemy to cut down their friends, while that enemy is entirely conscious of the fact that they are cutting down their own friends. And this is just one of the couple things that a Yamanaka clan member can do if they're outnumbered. The other is the mind clone switch technique, which sees a Yamanaka clan member cloning their consciousness so they can implant their consciousness into more than one person simultaneously. And since this technique requires the Yamanaka clan member to try and hit more than one person with their consciousness simultaneously. While using this technique, they're able to bend their consciousness beam. But techniques we've seen before in the anime are so boring, right? We should talk about some light novel techniques. You've never heard of it, have you? That's because this ability hails from one of the lesser known light novels in Naruto's universe, Naruto Jin Raiden, The Day the Wolf Howled. This light novel takes place directly after Sasuke's battle against Itachi, but before he awoke his MS. And it's over the course of this light novel that Sasuke begins to hear about Itachi, how he truly was. However, while Sasuke is loosely following Itachi's footsteps in this light novel, he bumps into the Kodon clan, who live in the Howling Wolf Village. And the members of the Kodon clan have a very interesting ability. They have an ability to make a Sai Genzai within their body. Now, a Sai Genzai in the Naruto universe is a Genjutsu-inducing drug, kind of like the Genjutsu-inducing pill that Orochimaru gave to Blue B to make him lose control of Giyuki. However, the Genjutsu-inducing drug that the Kodon clan create in their body operates a bit differently. See, the drug that they create is called Kotaro, and it was actually originally created 
created by a member of the Kodan clan named Tenma as a way to control Rowan, a monster that resembles the crossing of a tiger and a wolf, an entity that in the past used to constantly attack the Kodan clan. However, this ability to create the Kotaro inside of their body is not a Keke Genkai. It's more like a biological function, as Kodan clansmen are only able to make Kotaro by consuming the plant life that exists around the Howling Wolf Village. And upon eating this plant, they're able to expel purple gaseous clouds that induce Genjutsu when inhaled. However, Kotaro, while technically being able to induce Genjutsu, if mixed with other herbs, can actually be used medicinally. And this is actually why Itachi went to the Howling Wolf Village in the first place, as Itachi used Kotaro mixed with other herbs as eye drops to extend his life. And Sasuke begins to use his eye drops after he awakens his MS and experiences eye irritation. So all in all, the Kodan clan are able to make clouds of purple haze that make you see things and hear things that may not be there. Sounds like something legally acquirable in this great state of California. But you know what you can't buy anywhere? This next jutsu, because coming up at number six, we have the hydrification technique. See, the hydrification technique is probably the most widely mislabeled jutsu as a Keke Genkai in all of Naruto. But it's not a Keke Genkai, which is terrifying because it means that other people outside of the Hozuki clan might actually be able to use this technique. But before I get into describing what this technique does, I should probably brush up on the fact that it's used by the Hozuki clan, one of the strongest and most storied clans out of the Hidden Mist Village, responsable for the creation of the second Mizukage. This technique allows the member of the Hozuki clan to liquefy any part of their body. However, they don't just liquefy their bodies into water. At least in the case of Gengetsu Hozuki, the second Mizukage, he liquefies his body into a combination of water and oil, which allows him to seep through things like Gara's ceiling jutsus. And this technique is very powerful, incredibly underestimated, I believe. Because if anything, to me, it operates very similarly to Kamoi. Anytime the user is struck by a physical attack, they can just liquefy the part of their body that's about to be struck, and the person who's about to stab them, punch them, or kick them just goes through them, leaving the Hozuki clan member completely unharmed. But the applications of the hydrification technique go far beyond just defense. See, the hydrification technique can be used for reconnaissance, getting away from a battle, sneaking into a place you wouldn't be able to get into otherwise. See, a Hozuki clan member could just be a puddle on the side of the road, and you wouldn't know. On top of this, if a Hozuki clan member goes into a body of water, they can control the entire body of water. And since their body has become water, you technically don't know where in that body of water they are. Not to mention, let's say there's a small crack into a building that a Hoski clan member wants to infiltrate. Considering the fact that water can take the form of quite literally anything, they can just funnel themselves through that crack. But they can go even further beyond this. A Hoski clan member can pump water into their muscles to increase their own physical strength. Just how Sway Getsu was able to wield the executioner blade so effortlessly. On top of this, since their body is already water, any Hoski clan member is able to pull off water bullet technique very easily, giving them a very very versatile and easy to use mid to long range option. The only real weakness to this hydrification technique is the fact that it inherently has a large weakness to lightning release. But so long as they avoid lightning release, there's basically no weaknesses to this technique outside of, I guess, probably also ice release. And of course, the fact that any member of the Hoseki clan who has access to this technique has to stay incredibly well hydrated because their body isn't 70% water, it's 100% water. But enough about the hydrification technique, let's talk about a jutsu we've already brought up multiple times in this video the partial expansion jutsu also known as the multi-size technique so this technique is used by the akamichi and when used the akamichi grow in strength in size and weight yeah that's right the akamichi don't become hollow when they expand their arms or legs or become massive any size increase in akamichi undergoes also undergoes a weight increase but akamichi aren't only able to expand their own body they're also able to expand the clothes they're wearing and any weapons they may be holding like the bow staff that chozo chose Koji's father uses. However, because technically they are creating mass out of nothing, this does put a huge strain on their body. And therefore, most Akamichi clan members will only try to maintain this change in body size for as long as absolutely necessary. However, by the time that the fourth great shinobi world war rolls around, Choza and Choji are able to use this technique at its highest level almost limitlessly. Because by the time that the fourth war rolled around, nobody had limits anymore. Remember when Kakashi could use like three Chidori's a day? Now, there are really two ways this 
technique gets used. One is the increasing of a certain body part or the entire body in a proportionate fashion. That is to say, they make their arm really big to deliver a significantly more powerful punch, or an Akamichi clan member makes their own body 300 or 400 feet tall so they can wrestle the ten tails. However, this proportionate change isn't the only way that this multi-size technique can be used. As we've also seen multiple Akamichi members expand their body into the shape of a ball. Now, this is usually to pull off a technique known as human bullet tank. It's a taijutsu ability that has the Akamichi member expand their body into a ball and then contract their arms, legs, and head into said ball. It's at which point that they begin rolling at an incredibly high rate. And since their weight has been so massively increased, this ball can shell out some serious damage. And there are tons of different variations to the human bullet tank. One where Shikamaru grabs Choji and uses him like a flail. Times where Choji will undergo the transformation and then put a bunch of kunai around his body to make himself a spiked ball and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's just the Akamichis trying their best to emulate Sonic, though arguably much bigger. The true strength of the technique comes from either partial expansion or full body expansion jutsu. Partial expansion jutsu allows the Akamichi clan member to expand a certain part of their body, which is how Choji bagged Karui, if you know what I mean. But usually an Akamichi clan member will use this technique on their hands or their feet and not only increase the force and weight behind their blows, but also effectively increase their range. And since this partial expansion happens so quickly, it can surprise the enemy, who originally believe they're out of the range of the Akamichi clan member, but then end up very much getting smoked by a two-ton fist. The highest level of this technique, however, is the full body expansion jutsu, which is most clearly shown when Choji and Choza battled against the Ghetto Statue, which is the husk of the Ten Tails, a very intimidating enemy. Now, it's stated in the data book that Choji, with the use of this technique, is able to become the size of a mountain, and he's able to undergo this transformation at the speed of lightning, which is kind of like saying Choji can become 1,000 feet tall in an instant. Now, we don't know how big a mountain is, but the best comparison would be Choji becoming a substantially larger Colossal Titan and transforming a lot faster than the Colossal Titan transforms. But there's an even further way for the Akamichi clan to increase their power and that's butterfly mode. See, like we've already stated, this technique hinges on the Akamichi's innate ability, calorie conversion, where an Akamichi clan member will convert all of the calories in their body into chakra. And the chakra overflows to such a level that it's released from their shoulder blades and therefore creates the image of butterfly wings. In this form, the Akamichi clan member will have access to the highest level of Akamichi techniques, like the butterfly bullet barrage, which allows the Akamichi clan member to focus the chakra from their wings into their fists, which gives them on top of their massive physical strength, chakra boosted strength, making this one of the most devastating punches in the Naruto universe. However, while the Akamichi clan technique is incredibly strong, it may not be the strongest hidden technique amongst Inashika Cho, because I would have to give that honor to the Shadow Imitation Jutsu. See, well, technically, in terms of brute force and physical strength, the Shadow Imitation Jutsu is much weaker than the multi-size technique. When in the right hands, and the right hands in this circumstance are the Nara Clan, the Shadow Imitation Technique can be one of the strongest Jutsus in all of Naruto. See, this technique is obviously used by the Nara Clan, and allows them, through the usage of Yin Release, to control their shadow. See, the member of the Nara clan is able to manipulate their shadow in basically any way they want. However, the Nara clan member is held back by the fact that they can only use as much shadow as they have. That is to say that the longer or larger that a Nara clan member's shadow is, the more shadow they have to work with. But at times like high noon, when you barely have any shadow at all, a Nara clan member is actually at their weakest. Therefore, if you're far enough away from a Nara clan member that they can't reach you with their shadow, you're safe. But that's only if there's no other shadows. See, while technically there is is a limited range that a Nara clan member can extend their shadows if there's no other shadows, a Nara clan member can extend their shadow through as many shadows as they want limitlessly. So let's say hypothetically you were fighting in the middle of the woods while the sun was up because so many shadows are cast by the trees and the leaves and the sticks. Nara clan member is able to extend their shadow from shadow to shadow to shadow almost limitlessly, giving them really unlimited range and options, which makes sense when you consider the fact that the Nara clan is one of the oldest clans within the land of fire as they're tied to the Nara forest, which is actually based off of a real area in Japan where sacred deers live. And the Nara clan keep an eye over these sacred 
for deers and use their antlers for medicinal properties. As the Nar clan are actually more associated with medicine and politics than combat. But there is still definitely weaknesses to this technique. In fact, we learned in Shikamaru Hedon, the first of Shikamaru's two light novels, that his technique can't be used in utter darkness. That even though the entire world is cast into a shadow in utter darkness, since Shikamaru himself is technically not casting a shadow, he has nothing to manipulate. Now, the true strength of this technique is that if a Nara clan member is able to merge their shadow with yours, they're able to control your body. And the only thing that you're able to do is speak. So if a Nara clan member is able to merge their shadow with yours, if they wave their hand, you wave yours. And because of this, Nara clan members actually usually tend to wear kunai holders in atypical places. With the best example of this being Shikamaru, who wears a kunai holder on his thigh. Because of this, when Shikamaru, who catches somebody in his shadow imitation technique, reaches for a kunai and goes to throw it at the person who he's just caught and is now freezing, he won't receive a kunai back, as the person will just grab at their thigh and grab nothing. But this technique is probably the most taxing one we're going to talk about on this list, as even after you merge shadows with somebody, keeping them bound is incredibly difficult. It's not only chakra depletive, but if the person is physically strong enough, they're simply able to just break out of your shadows. However, one of the largest strengths of this technique is that because technically it's yin release and therefore the manipulation of something that doesn't technically exist, a shadow, things like palm renigons and karma markings can't absorb these shadows, which actually makes Shikamaru oddly relevant in Boruto. But simply controlling somebody's movements and throwing a kunai at them aren't everything you can accomplish with this technique. Shikamaru has also shown us that he's able to pick up and throw things with his technique using the shadow clutch technique, which we've seen him use to throw everything from kunai to Choji. But speaking of kunai, Shikamaru also taught himself something very important as it pertains to kunai, specifically the shadow imitation kunai technique, where Shikamaru imbues chakra into one of Asuma's chakra blades and throws it into somebody's shadow, which if they do come into contact with somebody's shadow, frees them in place. But if Shikamaru or any Nara clan member wants to get slightly more sadistic, they can use things like the shadow sewing technique, which create long sharp tendrils out of the shadow that the Nara clan member is controlling that either wrap around their target, binding them physically, or simply pierce and attack their target. And since it is so hard to physically control somebody using the shadow imitation technique, this technique allows them to make sure that the person that they're trying to control is even more physically bound. If the Nara clan member is more worried about just getting rid of somebody and not binding them, there's always the shadow neck binding technique, where upon merging their shadow with somebody else's, the Nara clan member then takes their shadow and works it up their enemy's body until it's grasping their neck. They then use the strength of the shadow to choke their enemy to death. After the shadow imitation technique, we have an entry that might be cheating. Because coming in at number three, we have the Amarame's bugs. Now listen, technically are the Amarame's bugs a jutsu? No. Technically is controlling them even a jutsu? Also, no. See, the Amarame have a mutually beneficial contract with the bugs that they control. See, the Amarame have six different types of bugs they control, and all six of these bugs need chakra to survive. Therefore, the Amarame let these bugs live inside their body, feeding off their chakra in exchange for these bugs fighting for the Amarame, creating symbiosis between the Amarame clan and the bugs who live off of them, or I guess the better term would be in them. But because of this, the Amarame are able to use ninjutsu-like techniques without weaving hand signs or even using additional chakra, which is kind of crazy. Longevity-wise, there's few people who can hold a candle to the Abarame. Longevity in battle, that is. So long as the Abarame still have bugs to throw at you, they can keep on going. Because it doesn't matter what insect technique they're using, it doesn't require any additional chakra for them to use it. It's just the bugs that they're sending at you technically hold an infinitesimally small amount of their chakra. Now, instead of going into all of the things that the Abarame use their bugs for, I'm just going to go over the different types of bugs they have. Have. The most common bug they use is the Kikaichu. They're small beetles with the ability to fly that people like Shino use to create fists out of bugs or walls out of bugs or used to grab onto things or create insect clones out of. They're the worker bee of the Abarame, the bug that every Abarame member is able to control. Outside of them, there's also the Bikochu. Now, this was an insect that was used by the Abarames in the Great Ninja Wars. However, it's incredibly rare and hard to find and therefore is no longer used. This bug has an incredible sense of smell, said to be greater than that of a ninja Ken, a ninja dog. And it's said that this bug is able to track a scent from countries away. Outside of that, there's the Abarame's scariest bug, the Kidaichu. See, this bug is only used by select members of the Abarame clan, and for good reasons. See, the Kidaichu start out very small, and they need to be fed an exact amount of chakra, otherwise they will begin to consume all of the chakra they can get and massively expand in 
the size. Because of this, simply having these Kidai Chu in their body puts any Abarabe clan member who's using them in danger. Should their chakra begin to fluctuate and they give the Kidai Chu the wrong amount of chakra, they will explode. Because of this, Abarabe clan members who are able to use these bugs inject these bugs into other people. Other people who aren't able to regulate the chakra flow that these bugs need, and therefore these people explode from the inside out. We saw Shino use this against some Tentails clones. The Kidai Chu isn't even the strongest bug the Amarame can use. That would be either the Kochu, the bug used by Yoji Abarame to kill Shisui. That's roughly the size of a mosquito keto imperceptible and its bite not only paralyzes you but poisons you to the point of death and not only that the poison used by this bug is untraceable in autopsies or the rinkaichu which are a breed of nano-sized venomous insects they're only used by very few abarame clansmen mostly because these nano-sized bugs cover your skin and anybody you come into contact with will begin to have their skin eaten by these rinkaichu and these rinkaichu will very quickly eat away at all of the flesh that they come into contact with meaning not only do you have the offensive capability to melt away anyone's flesh but if anybody comes into contact with you their flesh will also melt giving you one of the most well-rounded offensive and defensive abilities in all of naruto but who needs defense when you can be all offense because that's what we're talking about at our number two spot which is the Adamantite Chains. Now, the Adamantite Chains belonged to the Uzumaki clan, one of the strongest clans in Naruto's history. This technique has Uzumaki clan members manifesting Adamantite Chains out of their torso. And these Adamantite Chains, while sometimes used offensively, are more often than not used for sealing. See, Adamantite is the strongest material in Naruto's universe, and therefore being able to manifest and manipulate chains made out of this material makes for some pretty strong sealing techniques. But the adamantite sealing chains go beyond just tensile strength. Adamantite chains also suppress the chakra of what's ever being sealed by them. Meaning not only are you being sealed by the vibranium of the Naruto universe, but you can't use any of your chakra to try and destroy it. And this technique is shown multiple times to be one of the strongest jutsus in Naruto, as Kushina was not only able to bind Kurama in her subconscious using the adamantite chain, but also after having Kurama pulled out of her, something that should have killed her was able to create a barrier using the adamantite chains that not only Kurama couldn't break out of, but Hiruzen couldn't break into. And then, once again, after having Kurama pulled out of her, she was able to, by herself, hold Kurama, the entirety of him, pretty still. I mean, you know, like, not still enough but she was at like 10 percent strength i can't blame her for that the next time that we saw adamantite chains is during the fourth great shinobi world war when karin awakens to them karin uses this ability to basically destroy a true 1000 arms canon from obito who's using wood release now obviously it's not a true 1000 armed canon but it was a giant wooden construct that was using a bunch of arms to attack her and while obviously in the moment this looked incredibly powerful we learned in the data book that this was only a glimpse of what kushina was able to pull off with her adamantite sealing chain. So all in all, did one of the strongest clans in Naruto have one of the strongest hidden jutsus in Naruto? Yeah, of course they did, but not the strongest hidden jutsu in all of Naruto. No, because that title belongs to our number one spot, Fury. The Fury is a non-canon jutsu. It's a technique developed by a man by the name of Enno Gyoja. And this man passed this technique down to his granddaughter who had the technique implanted onto her back. And therefore, technically, this hidden jutsu doesn't belong to an area or a clan, but just kind of a family. And that's not the only rule that this technique breaks as it pertains to hidden jutsus, as this technique and how you pull it off is also transcribed on a scroll, a scroll that can also be used to destroy the inscription on the back of Hotaru's back and therefore get rid of this jutsu forever. But what makes this technique so strong? Well, this technique is a city buster, or I guess in Naruto, a village buster. This technique requires the user to pull in a massive amount of nature energy. And upon pulling in this massive amount of nature energy, that massive amount of nature energy is released in the form of an explosion. An explosion which is explicitly stated to be able to destroy the likes of Konoha, the biggest village in Naruto. Now, obviously the prep time of having to pull off the prior move of pulling in a ton of nature chakra is kind of a hassle, but you can collect this nature energy 
anywhere. You can collect this nature energy outside of Konoha and then waltz into the center of it and explode. And the craziest bit about all of this is that the explosion doesn't kill the person who's doing the exploding. So you can pull off a feat that required Nagato sending all of his chakra to the Deva path and quite literally shortened his life, destroying Konoha, by simply collecting all of the nature energy around you, waltzing into a town, exploding, and then, you know, waltzing out. So yeah, as the only technique on this list that's able to destroy entire villages, it's gonna get the one spot. Thank God it's not canon. What do you guys think? What's your favorite hidden jutsu? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. We're trying to translate all of our videos into other languages, and now I'm afraid of using words like waltzing, because like, who knows what waltzing is gonna translate into in Arabic, and they're gonna be like, why are they doing the tango into the middle of a village, and who knows, man? Hopefully it turns out well, I won't know.